All right, I think we can get started. So again, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Um, Dr. David Nazarian will be our speaker for the evening. Um, Dr. Nazarian is a fellowship trained board certified orthopedic surgeon. He completed his internship and residency at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center at New York Orthopedic Hospital and then pursued fellowship training in adult reconstructive and total joint surgery at Rothman Orthopedic Institute at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. He has been in practice for over 20 years and specializes in hip and knee replacement and revision hip and knee replacement. He has authored numerous publications and has presented at orthopedic meetings both regionally and nationally. Um, if you do have questions during tonight's presentation, please feel free to enter them in the Q&A box. We'll take some time at the end to to answer those and, and um, Dr. Nazarian is happy to answer throughout his presentation as well. So please enter them in there. Yeah, Dr. Nazarian. Thank you so much, Natalie. Um, it's good to have everyone, uh, albeit virtually. Um, hopefully we can get as many people online as possible and uh, feel free to please ask me questions throughout the presentation. Um, I want this to be as interactive as possible and I want the learning to be maximized as much as possible. So I'll talk to you about some of the latest trends and updates in the treatment of hip and knee arthritis and what we're doing, and uh, especially from a non-surgical and surgical standpoint to let you know what we're doing now and, and our latest technologies that we have to treat hip and knee arthritis. sure why this is amazing. Okay, so this is myself uh, as a youngster teaching my uncle how to drive a tractor. I worked on my family's vegetable farm as a youth uh, where we raised uh, corn, sweet peas, greens, uh, tomatoes, cubes, all kinds of vegetables that were grown in Massachusetts, which is where I grew up in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And so we had a large farm there that's still ongoing. And so I learned from an early age, the value of hard work. And I discovered early on some of the things that were happening in some of my family members that I saw orthopedic issues that got me interested potentially in a career in medicine. There was me as a marketing maven advertising literally some of the fruits of our labor in our farm stand. And as a, uh, a slightly older youth uh, on the football gridiron, I got to see some of my friends and teammates get injured and be treated by orthopedic surgeons. And so that interested me again in a career in medicine and in treating the musculoskeletal system. Arthritis is one of the biggest problems that we face uh, worldwide because arthritis isn't going away and it continues to get worse. And now that the population is aging and people are remaining more active in their later years, it's more and more people are suffering from arthritis. So we talk about arthritis. It's commonly seen on TV where we talk about arthritis and advertisements for treatment for arthritis but it amazes me how many people don't understand what arthritis actually is. So the word arthritis, arthro, uh, comes from joint, it's Greek for joint, and itis is Latin for inflammation. So arthritis is inflammation of the joint. Now, how do we get inflammation and what is inflammation? Yet another term that's commonly talked about in lay public and on television and in the lay press, but many people don't understand what actually inflammation is. So everyone is aware if they've spent any time in, in the kitchen, what happens when you mix vinegar and baking soda. And so if you see in this beaker, I'm mixing a little bit of vinegar and now pour in some baking soda and what happens, it bubbles up it creates a chemical reaction. And so if you put your hand on the side of that beaker, you'd actually feel warmth exuding from that chemical reaction by mixing the vinegar and baking soda. And what happens in the body is a chemical reaction because the body's white blood cells are going to an area in the body to try and heal that area or to defend it 
from an infection, say, and they release their defense chemicals. And the defense chemicals that are released by the body's white blood cells cause the same type of heat producing or exothermic reaction that occurs when you mix vinegar and baking soda. And so what happens when you get the body's white blood cells releasing their defense chemicals into an area of the body, you get heat from that chemical reaction, you get swelling from the bubbles that form. And of course that heat and swelling causes pain. And so inflammation is nothing more than the body's white blood cells responding to an area of injury, releasing their chemicals, ultimately causing heat, swelling, and pain. And so now what incites the inflammatory process? What causes it? And usually in the joint, it's the loss of cartilage. So arthritis is nothing more than the loss of cartilage at the end of the bone, which incites the inflammatory process. So now here you see an arthroscopic view or a view where a scope is stuck inside a person's knee joint. And you can see the cartilage is very white. Uh, it looks almost like pure driven snow um, where it's untouched and, and pristine. And so that's what normal cartilage looks like inside the body's uh, knee you know, or hip joint or any of the other joints, cartilage that covers the end of the bone. Whereas muscle is, uh, is red. So cartilage is white because it doesn't have its own direct blood supply. And anything in the body that doesn't have its own direct blood supply doesn't heal. And so when cartilage starts to wear away, it doesn't get built back because it can't heal because it doesn't have its own direct blood supply. Whereas muscle, if you cut your skin, it bleeds a lot, or if you cut your arm more deeply, that tissue, either muscular or skin tissue, heals because it has its own blood supply, whereas cartilage doesn't heal. Fingernails, you, if you tear your fingernail or get a hangnail, of course it doesn't bleed, but then again, it doesn't heal. You can tape it, you can glue it, you can put a Band-Aid on it, but a fingernail won't heal because it doesn't have its own direct blood supply, just like hair. You can cut a piece of hair or tear a piece of hair, but it's not, if you put it back together, it's not gonna heal because it doesn't have its own direct blood supply. And that's why arthritis is so pervasive and why so prevalent in our society because cartilage essentially doesn't heal because it doesn't have its own direct blood supply. And so here you see an example of an arthritic joint where compared to the previous picture where I showed you that nice pristine cartilage, you can see the cartilage has been beaten up. It has a lot of pock marks in it, divots in, on the end of it. And the, that cartilage never regrows again because again, the cartilage is white and doesn't have its own blood supply. And so osteoarthritis, which is a wear and tear arthritis, is very much like wearing the Teflon off your fry pan or wearing the tread off your car tire. Once that car tire wears away, it doesn't come back. And so you actually have to change the tire or put a brand new tire. And cartilage is very much like that. And so now what's rheumatoid arthritis? Osteoarthritis, we said, was wear and tear arthritis, where you wear the cartilage um, from friction after many years off of the end of the bone. Whereas rheumatoid arthritis is a systemic condition where the body's immune system actually goes haywire and recognizes cartilage as if it were a foreign invader. And so cartilage is then attacked by the body's own immune system. And so rheumatoid arthritis is more of a systemic condition so that the body's immune cells are programmed against the own patient's own cartilage and attack the cartilage. And so many of the treatments for rheumatoid arthritis are systemic treatments that suppress the immune system. And so that's why when you hear or see an advertisement about a rheumatoid arthritis drug, they tell you that one of the risks is an increased risk of cancer or infection because it suppresses the body's immune system, trying to slow down the body's attack on its own cartilage. And so here you see an anatomy of a hip joint. The anatomy of the hip 
as you can see, essentially is a ball and socket joint. The ball rotates with six degrees of freedom inside the socket, which is quite deep inside a patient's pelvis. And so on the left, you can see an example of a good hip where you see the ball and then the socket and then cartilage in between, as you can see depicted uh, in front of that arrow. Whereas on the right side, you see an example of a badly arthritic hip where you see there's no real cartilage space between the ball and the socket and the head, the ball actually becomes misshapen because of the bone spurs that occur. And bone spurs generally occur when the body senses that the cartilage is wearing away, it lays down more bone thinking that it's spreading out the forces over a larger surface area and it lays down bone spurs, which causes the ball to become misshapen. And you can see the ball on the right is grossly misshapen compared to the ball on the left. The anatomy of the knee, as you can see, the thigh bone is up top, the shin bone is below, and the joint space in between is where the cartilage is. And so the knee is essentially like a hinge joint, and it works like a hinge with a little bit of play in it which the play is created by the ligaments that attaches on either side of the knee. So there are two different types of cartilage inside the knee joint. There's the shock absorbing cartilage, which is the meniscus cartilage. You often hear about a patient saying that they had a torn cartilage or torn meniscus. The shock absorbing cartilage called meniscus, there are two of them, one on the inner side of the knee and one on the outer side of each knee. And those serve as shock absorbers to protect the cartilage that coats the end of the bone, which we call articular cartilage. The surface cartilage or articular cartilage is what coats the end of the bone, and that's the more important of the two cartilage in the knee. And when you start to wear that cartilage away, that's when you get arthritis in the knee. So arthritis is nothing more than wearing away by wear and tear or through a systemic condition such as rheumatoid arthritis of the surface cartilage on the end of the bone in the knee joint or in the hip joint or in any other joint for that matter. And so on the left, you see an example of a good knee joint where the thigh bone or femur is above, the tint shin bone or tibia is below, and there's a nice symmetric cartilage thick space between those bones. Whereas on the right side, you can see the bone and as now touching a bone, the thigh bone is touching the shin bone or the femur is touching the tibia because the cartilage is in between has been completely worn away. And that knee is now bone on bone. And so if you're trying to call our office and you wanna see a specific practitioner, there are different practitioners or subspecialists in our practice, some that practice sports medicine, or there are actually non-operative sports medicine doctors as well, versus a joint replacement surgeon such as myself, who treats both non-operative and operative patients. But generally, my expertise is to do surgery on patients who have significant arthritis that has not been amenable to non-operative care such as medicine or injection. So generally patients who seek out the advice of a sports medicine doctor, either a non-operative sports medicine doctor or a surgeon sports medicine doctor are younger patients, generally those who are less than 40 or 50, uh, patients who have an MRI that shows only a meniscus tear without any arthritis because once they have a meniscus tear, but they also have a loss of the surface cartilage or arthritis, treating the meniscus tear alone is really not fruitful. And if a surgeon does an arthroscopic surgery on a knee that has a meniscus tear in the setting of arthritis, that knee can actually be made worse and can be made much more painful by doing an arthroscopic procedure on that joint. And then if, of course, if the patient only has a few weeks of symptoms, generally that's not an arthritic joint. And if they've never been told they have arthritis, unlikely would they have arthritis in a joint that is symptomatic for a short period of time and they never knew they had any arthritis. Whereas patients who generally seek out the advice of a joint replacement surgeon 
may be more mature. Generally, as we old, as we uh, get more mature and older in life, is when we start to wear out the joints and develop osteoarthritis. If an MRI shows not only a meniscus tear but also arthritis, then generally seeing seeing someone like myself is appropriate. If they have three months or more of symptoms. And if they've had an injection by either their primary care or a non-operative sports medicine doctor, and the injection really didn't work, they should probably see somebody like myself who performs a joint replacement surgery. Not that I'm necessarily going to recommend that, but it's probably more appropriate to see someone with that level of expertise to decide on the appropriate treatment and timing of treatment. Now, how do we prevent arthritis? Of course, hearing some of the three things that we hate hearing our doctor say, diet, exercise, and weight loss. Diet actually does seem to slow down the arthritic process. There are anti-inflammatory diets now. Tom Brady, of course, espouses his TB12 diet, which is filled with anti-inflammatory foods such as avocado or blueberries and strawberries and, and having a minimization of eating tomatoes and other nightshades such as mushrooms, which will minimize the amount of inflammation in our body. Exercise seems to stimulate um, the fluid that supplies nutrition to the cartilage. And even though the cartilage doesn't have its blood supply, it gets its nutrition from the joint lubricating fluid around it. So exercise tends to lubricate the joint and provide more nutrition to the cartilage. And weight loss seems to affect the cartilage by putting less stress on it. That stands to reason that the more weight you gain, the more stress you put on the cartilage. And the more weight you lose, the less stress you put on the cartilage. But this is multiplied by a factor of many times because the biomechanics of the joint are such that, at least in the knee, For every pound you gain or lose, you're putting six pounds more across that joint. So an average 200 pound male actually puts 1200 pounds because of the biomechanics and the vectors that occur of forces around that joint, generally puts about 1200 pounds of force across that knee joint. So it's amazing that cartilage, which is only about a quarter of an inch thick, can last a patient for 70, 80, or even 90 years without ever fully wearing out because there's a tremendous amount of forces being placed across that joint beyond what a patient's weight is. So you lose a pound, you take six pounds off your joint. And this gentleman who is 2,500 pounds, probably the grandfather of the people who are on my 600 pound life actually put 1500 pounds across his knee joints because of that biomechanical factor occurring within the joint. And so what do we do to try and slow that arthritis down? There have been health food supplements such as glucosamine chondroitin, which some people have felt these chondroitin and glucosamine are some of the basic building blocks of cartilage. And so it was thought and espoused by some of the other companies that make this product, that if you ingested it, you'd actually be able to build back your cartilage. Well, that's like saying you're going to eat monkey brains and it's gonna make you smarter. Of course, that doesn't happen. However, they have uh, attached radioactive isotopes to this product and it has shown up in the joints at a higher rate after patients are eating it. It doesn't build back cartilage, but it probably provides an anti-inflammatory effect. But when this stuff was first marketed, so many patients were interested in getting it that they were actually overdosing on the product and it was having a, a counterproductive effect. So I had a lot of patients coming in bringing bottles and bottles of this stuff because they really wanted to take it uh, by droves to try and prevent the development and progression of arthritis, but it doesn't seem to do that. But it does make a certain percentage of the population feel better because it does take away inflammation from the joint. And so some of the other treatments of arthritis, of course, include some of the medicines that we have and some of the surgical treatments, which I'll show you. On the anti-inflammatory drugs, 
such as aspirin or Motrin or Advil or ibuprofen or Celebrex, <clears throat> those are typical anti-inflammatories. And what those drugs do is they block the body's white blood cells from releasing those defense chemicals I talked about earlier. So that's what the anti-inflammatories do. Methotrexate is a much more powerful anti-inflammatory and that actually takes away um, some of the symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis and blocks the immune system from releasing some of those defense chemicals which are, uh, which are uh, caused in a patient who has severe rheumatoid arthritis. And so that's what these anti-inflammatory drugs do, but they have a systemic effect. So we treat patients or, and recommend anti-inflammatories, but sometimes they have systemic effects and they can have side effects as well. Um, they can cause such things as stomach upset or bleeding or kidney problems. And so that's why we tell patients to take these drugs in a limited time frame so that they don't lead to more serious side effects such as ulcers or kidney suppression in the function. And so the other thing we do is injections. And what we do is take an anti-inflammatory drug such as a steroid like cortisone, which also has anti-inflammatory effects to block the body's white blood cells from releasing those inflammatory chemicals and inject that medication directly into the joint. So it doesn't have really any systemic effects and has all of its anti-inflammatory effects within the joint itself. And you get the highest bang for your buck. Obviously it comes with the cost of needing an injection, which is less invasive of course than taking an anti-inflammatory medicine such as aspirin, but it has a greater effect on that specific joint. Another injectable medication is uh, visco supplement or synvisc or orthovisc. These are viscous substances. They are created by um, chemicals which naturally occur with inside the joint, hyaluronic acid, which is a naturally occurring substance in the joint lubricating fluid. And then they're suspended in a viscous substance. So it's almost like a lubricant or um, for the end of the bones and for the joint and for the cartilage. It doesn't provide any anti-inflammatory effect like cortisone does, but it can lubricate the end of the joint. It doesn't work for everyone, just like cortisone doesn't work for everyone. But these are administered either through three or four separate injections or one single injection. They have some versions of it which come in a single injection version or some which orthovisc is a three injection version. And so this is simply like pouring motor oil on the inside of your joint to lubricate the ends of the bone and make them more slippery uh, from this viscous substance. And it works for some, but doesn't work for everyone. Now, what about some of the surgical things that we have to offer? We have arthroscopic surgery, which of course, of course occurs uh, for people and is used for people who have meniscus tears, but not very well used in the setting of people who have arthritis or a wearing away of their surface cartilage. Arthroscopic surgery is actually frowned upon when you have a significant amount of arthritis in the joint. There's joint replacement, and then there's joint resurfacing, which I'll share and show you some surgical examples of that. So here you see me doing an arthroscopy where I stuck a scope inside this person's knee and I'm shaving down any torn edges of the meniscus. The meniscus tears very much like your hangnail. So what do you do for a torn hangnail? You either snip it with a nail clipper or you file it down with an emery board. And that's what we do on the inside of the joint. We use this rotary device, which works very much like a rotary nose hair clipper and it shaves down smooth the surface of that meniscus. But as you can see, this scope is inside of a joint where the cartilage up above is pristine. There's really no arthritis in this joint. And so those are the patients that are indicated for an arthroscopic procedure. If they have a tear of the meniscus, but really no loss of the surface cartilage. Because what happens is if you do an arthroscopy on somebody who has a meniscus tear, and arthritis or a loss of the surface cartilage is when you do that procedure, 
the body goes into a healing mode after the procedure, after any procedure for that matter. And as part of the hyper healing mode, it creates inflammation to heal the surgical incision site. And as part of the inflammation, if you already have existing uh, cartilage loss, that inflammation will be made worse and the cartilage loss will be made worse from the inflammatory process and the symptoms from that arthritis will be made worse. And so that's why we try not to do arthroscopic surgery on patients who have arthritis. So many times patients come to me and say, can't you clean out the arthritis? Well, no, we can clean out a meniscus tear, but you can't clean out arthritis because an arthroscope is good for shaving things away. And certainly you don't want to shave away the cartilage on the end of the bone, because that'd be like saying, well, I lost a few of my car treads on the tire. And if I shave it down with a sander and take the rest of the tread down, am I going to make that tire any better? No, of course, you're going to make the tire worse. And that's why we don't clean out the joint or clean out the cartilage in arthritis. We clean out the meniscus cartilage, but we don't clean out the surface cartilage because that would only make the arthritis worse. Now, what about cartilage transplantation? This is something of interest and was in vogue many years, maybe 10 or 12 years ago. And we have very good ways to grow cartilage. We can take cartilage from non-weight bearing portions of the joint, grow it in a Petri dish, and then put it back in the joint. And so we have very good ways of growing the cartilage in a Petri dish, but we don't have very good ways of sticking the cartilage on the bone. We don't have very good glues that work to stick that cartilage. And then we know because cartilage doesn't have its own blood supply because it's white and doesn't have its own blood vessels percolating through it, that it won't heal to the surrounding cartilage and to the bone underneath. And so you can put that cartilage there, but then patients are required to stay off their knee or hip for six to nine months. And then the second they put weight back on it, the cartilage hasn't healed because it doesn't have good blood supply and then it is torn away. And so cartilage transplantation really is experimental only and doesn't really work very well in the real world because we don't have good glues to stick that cartilage there. And so now we do joint replacement. This was the, one of the first places where uh, joint replacements were performed in the Gross Clinic at, at uh, Thomas Jefferson University in the old original hospital buildings. And now we do it in a much more modern facility, as you can see below with very modern operating rooms. Here you see a modern operating room where I am with my staff getting ready to do a hip replacement. And you can see we work in an enclosed environment. Not only is the room itself enclosed, but the sterile field is enclosed in what we call a greenhouse so that there's a, a far fewer uh, amounts of dust or bacteria in that room within a room. And so it's an ultra clean environment. We use these exhaust helmets so that the patient isn't exposed to any of our bacteria that we may shed off of our skin. And the, the staff is also protected from the patient as well. And we do, I do over a thousand uh, procedures a year. And so I've done this for over 20 years, as Natalie said. So I've done over 20,000 hip and knee replacements in my career. Here you see an example of that bad hip I showed you earlier. And I was asked to speak just before dinner time. So I can show you a little bit of uh, surgical footage, which I'll show you in a little while. Um, now, what about if somebody has hip problems, oftentimes they point to their buttock or their low back and they, they're not sure whether it's coming from their spine or if it's coming from their hip. And so should they be seeing a spine specialist, either operative or non-operative, or should they be seeing a hip specialist? And it's hard sometimes for the patient to under identify that. And sometimes our staff, our non-clinical staff, who's answering the phone is sometimes has a difficult time discerning who the best practitioner is to see. And so if you have pain in your buttock or in the back of your thigh or in your low back, and it radiates all the way down to your calf, your foot, or your ankle, it's probably coming from your spine and coming from a pinched nerve in your back rather than your hip joint. 
people oftentimes point to their buttock or the side of their thigh and think it's coming from their hip. And it may be coming from the hip, but if it starts in the low back or in your buttock, it's probably more likely coming from your spine. And if the pain starts in the back, again, more likely coming from your low back. If the pain occurs when you're sitting or when you're lying down, when you're sitting and you're lying down, you're not really stressing the hip joint, but when you're sitting, you can actually stress the spine. The discs are actually under higher stress when you're sitting than when you're standing. And so sometimes when you're sitting or when you're lying down, you can put more stress on the discs in your spine and can cause more pain. So if you have pain when you're sitting or you're lying down, it's more likely a spine problem rather than a hip problem. But if it's a hip problem, generally the pain occurs and the groin or the inner thigh can occur in the outer, outer thigh as well, but you, generally speaking, starts in the groin. Oftentimes people think of it as, as them having a groin pull, and it's not necessarily a groin pull, but could be arthritis in the hip joint. If the pain goes to the knee, it very often is coming from the hip, but if it goes below the knee and all the way into your calf, foot, or ankle, it's probably coming from the low back or a pinched nerve in the spine because hip pain will send, will radiate down to the knee, but won't go below the knee. And if the hip joint is stiff, if you have difficulty putting on your shoes or your socks, generally speaking, that's coming from the hip joint. And stiffness can be a problem with the hip, but stiffness can be also a problem from the spine, but generally the spine won't give you trouble if putting shoes and socks on as much as the hip will. So here's an example of a hip. I do these hip replacements now through an anterior approach and the muscles in the front of the hip are much narrower so we can go between the muscles without creating any muscle cutting whatsoever. We dislocate and take the, the ball right out of the socket and then remove that arthritic ball, which has been denuded of all of its surface cartilage. And then what we do is we approach the socket and put retractors in so we can look at the socket and then ream away the worn out cartilage or the remainder of that cartilage from the socket and then put a device inside that socket which is shaped much like a hemisphere and has a rough and metal surface on it and your bone will actually grow into the nooks and crannies of that rough and metal surface which takes about a four to six week period of time and is solidly welded to the patient's own body. And so then a plastic liner goes in there, which acts as the artificial cartilage. And then we take a brooch, which works like a nail file and brooches in and creates a canal within the patient's narrow canal inside the femur bone. A ball is placed on top of that. And then the hip is then put back inside the joint. The hip is taken through extremes of motion. We make sure the patient comes out with their leg lengths nice and equal, which I pride myself on and getting a patient's leg lengths equal pretty much all the time. And then that device is placed inside the femur bone, which also has rough and metal surface. And then a ceramic ball is placed on top in order to recreate the uh, ball and socket joint. The operation takes roughly about 45 minutes. And these procedures will then last a patient up to 30 or more years. And in many cases last a patient uh, for the rest of their lifetime. And here you see an example of that hip, which was replaced, where we replaced the ball in the socket, the socket up above with a metallic socket that the bone grows into the nooks and crannies. The ball is then attached to the top of the stem and fits on top of the stem like a pen on a pen cap. And then the stem is wedge shaped and also has a rough and metal surface, which fits inside the femur bone. And as the patient puts weight on it, it's tightly fitting inside that bone and the, and the bone grows into the nooks and crannies of the surface of that prosthesis over a four to six week period of time. But because the prosthesis is put tightly in the bone, the patient can put their full weight on it right from the get-go, day one uh, from the procedure and, uh, and without having the bone grow into that prosthesis. And here you see an example of this patient who has gone through a minimally invasive approach and he was five hours after surgery already at home. I'm not a very good one.
He's getting naked. The incision is really on the upper part of the thigh. It's about four inches long. And a patient can be home in the comfort of their home all right the same day uh, of the surgery. And you can see this person was anesthetizing themselves with a little bit of uh, wine. Uh, but he is a surgeon himself. And he was back operating in his own operating room the following week after surgery. Here you see an example of a slightly younger gentleman in good shape. He was about 49 years old, and he was only six days after having his right hip replaced. So it's really amazing what people can do early on after having their joint replaced. He, and he sent this to me unsolicited saying, I hope I'm not overdoing it. Here you see an example of another fellow. You can see a very uh, big guy, big fellow. He was only three days after surgery and he sent me this video because he wanted to make sure he was using his cane correctly. So you can see people bounce back quite quickly after having a hip replacement. Now, what about knees? Here you see an example of a knee joint where the cartilage has been completely worn away on the inner side of the joint and also on the right x-ray under their kneecap. And so they have severe pain in their knee and, uh, and it's been worn away. They've tr they tried other treatments such as physical therapy. They've had injections over several year period, which no longer work. And now what we do for this is really resurface the end of the joint with a joint replacement. So people envision a knee replacement as chopping the ends of the bone off. That's not what we're doing. What we're doing is shaving away the worn out surfaces from the end of the joint. And we're just shaving away the very top cartilaginous surface from the end of the bone and recapping the end of the bone, both the end of the thigh bone and the top of the shin bone. And so we resurface this joint with a prosthesis prosthesis that looks very much like the shape of the end of the natural uh, thigh bone and the top of the shin bone. And so we're just shaving away that worn out cartilage. And the challenge that we have is to replace the surfaces of the joint with a prosthetic that works biomechanically very much like the patient's natural knee joint. And then uh, also affords ligamentous stability to the end of the joint so that the patient stands on their knee and hip with confidence. And so they can uh, go back to an active lifestyle. So not only do we resurface the joint, but also reconstruct the ligaments so that the ligaments are nice and taut around the knee. So it provides the patient with a nice, solid, stable joint. We also resurface the underside of the kneecap. So the biomechanics of the joint work correctly. So the kneecap is no longer rubbing bone against bone. and then. We have different types of prostheses. You can see this knee joint is fixed to the end of the bone with cement. So we have both cemented and cementless knee replacements, just like we have cemented and cementless hip replacements. The majority of hip replacements are done in a cementless fashion. And I would say the slight majority of knee replacements are done in a cemented fashion, but I do both cemented and cementless uh, knee replacements, as well as cemented and cementless hip replacements. And I use the patient's bone quality as an arbiter for when I decide whether I do cemented knees or cementless knees. And the same thing with hip replacements. If a patient has severe osteoporosis, I will do a cemented hip replacement. But if they have normal bone, then I'll do a cementless hip replacement and, and have the bone grow into the nooks and crannies. And you can see that this joint has been resurfaced, the lower end of the thigh bone, upper end of the shin bone, and then the plastic goes in between, which acts as the artificial cartilage inside that joint. Now, what about if we divide the knee into three parts, the inner side of the knee, the outer side, and the undersurface of the kneecap? And if you wear out just one part of the three parts of the joint, we can actually do a partial knee replacement as well. You don't have to replace the entire joint replacement. And so I do a lot of partial knee replacements in my practice for patients that just wear out one part of the joint. In this example, this particular patient wore out just the outside of their joint there where they're developing bone on bone, whereas the inside of the joint 
has a nice thick cartilaginous surface. So it's akin to having one bad tooth. If you just have one bad tooth, you just cap that one tooth. You don't take out the patient's entire dentition and give them a set of dentures. You just cap the one singular bad tooth. And so like, the, like uh, in the dental world, in knee replacement or knee resurfacing, I may resurface just the outer or inner or front side of that joint singularly if their arthritis is more limited to one part of the joint. But if it involves two or three of the compartments of the joint, then a full joint replacement is more appropriately indicated. And so here you see an example of me performing a partial knee replacement where you can see the incision is much smaller uh, the procedure is less invasive. And so generally speaking, because it's less invasive, the recovery is quicker um, and the patient returns back to their active lifestyle more quickly. The other advantage of a partial knee replacement is that when it does fully recover, it feels much more like a natural knee. And so I have performed this knee, on, this type of knee on, on many patients. I even did this on my mom's boyfriend's knees, both knees at the same time. And he became the designated runner for his softball team and sent me a half dozen snowbirds from Florida that said they wanted the same operation he had because his recovery was so smooth and quick. And he got back to his active lifestyle very quickly with a partial knee replacement such as this. So when it's appropriate and indicated, I'll do a partial knee. But if it's not indicated because more of the joint is involved, then a full replacement is more appropriate. And so the hospital that stay is getting shorter and shorter. Patients are leaving the hospital now, either the same day or the next day. I'm doing these operations on people from their 20s all the way up into their 90s. And I'd rather operate on a healthy 85-year-old than an unhealthy 55-year-old. So it really depends more on a patient's medical history. We're doing them on very small patients, such as a jockey like Willie Shoemaker or extremely tall patient like Will Chamberlain. So we can, we, and we have sizes that go from very small to very large and we have everything in between. We do now bloodless surgery. I've operated on hundreds and hundreds of Jehovah's Witness patients. And I take some of the principles and practices that I've learned and my Jehovah's Witness patients who refuse to take a blood transfusion and have applied those to my non-witness patients because I think everyone can benefit from those principles of minimally invasive surgery, doing them with very little to no transfusion at all. And most of my patients never get a transfusion. And then if necessary, I'll treat them with a medication called Procrit to build up their blood count prior to the surgery to make sure that they're not anemic and they wouldn't even need a transfusion after the surgery, which gets them out of the hospital much more quickly and gets them back to their active lifestyle much more quickly. Patient Dr. Terry, yes. I I'm sorry to interrupt you, but there are a couple of questions if you wanted to. Yeah, sure. We can interrupt okay. for a second. Okay. Um, there's a couple. The first one, um, if a patient is a cardiac patient with multiple stents, et cetera, can total knee replacement be done with twilight and spinal anesthesia? Absolutely. In fact, most of my patients, whether they're a cardiac patient or not, are done uh, with the spinal anesthetic and twilight sleep. Um, and so I, I take care of, I particularly take care of very complex subset of patients. And so most of those patients I'll take to Jefferson University Hospital, where I have a full cohort of practitioners, including cardiologists, cardiac surgeons, vascular surgeons and other practitioners at my disposal to help me take care, great care of those patients. And so I've taken care of a, uh, a large number of complicated patients with multiple medical comorbidities in my career and got them through the procedure very safely. And so the quick answer is yes, absolutely. And yeah, somebody who has multiple cardiac stents can be done can have a knee replacement and it can be done successfully so that you can get back to your active lifestyle. Okay, another question. Um, my, or my knees were replaced in 2013 at Jefferson by Rothman. How long will these bilateral knees last? And what are the symptoms indicating that artificial knees must be replaced for a second time? Well, generally pain is the first and foremost sign or giving way of the knee. 
would be another sign that something might be going wrong with the knee. Generally, if a patient had a knee replacement done in 2013, roughly nine years ago, they should be checked every couple of years. I usually like to check my patients every two or three years. If they're doing fine, you know, they could stretch it out to even three or four years. But I generally like to uh, review them, examine them, and also review their x-rays because sometimes things can happen on the x-rays and the patient doesn't even know about it. And so we usually like to see them with an x-ray to see if anything's wearing out. But sometimes those knees can last 20, 25, or even more years with a pain-free functional life and the patient can stay very active on those knees. So if somebody had their knees done in 2013, I would expect that they would still be going strong. But sometimes on rare occasions, there are patients who may have problems from their knees and they need to be checked out. So if they're doing fine, they don't necessarily have to come into the doctor and see them that often, but I would still probably see them every three or potentially four years. Okay, we'll do one more and then we'll, we'll let you go back and then we'll, we'll do other questions. Um, why does the recovery rate differ from patient to patient? Some recover within three to six months and other in two, others in two years. Sure. A lot of it, not that I'm blaming the patient, but a lot of it has to do with the patient because a lot of people... A, certainly perceive pain very differently. A lot of people have different levels of attitude and a lot of people perceive health, wellness and sickness very, very differently. You know, of course, they, we refer to the man flu because men uh, suffer from flu symptoms probably much worse than maybe women do because the, uh, women uh, have been used to things uh, with men or dealing with childbirth. But obviously it's, it's not only uh, gender differences, but there are cultural differences and there are person to person differences and genetic differences from people to people. So some people just are built to recover more quickly than others. Um, there are also differences in surgical techniques, of course. And I think people who have a minimally invasive technique generally on average tend to recover more quickly. People who have a partial knee replacement on average tend to recover more quickly than somebody who has a full replacement. That doesn't mean that everybody should be getting a partial knee replacement because if you have arthritis in multiple parts of your joint and undergo a partial knee replacement, you're not gonna do as well as somebody who has arthritis in multiple parts of your joint and has a full replacement. Uh, and then, of course, it comes down to um, the quality of the surgery. Um, obviously, you want to go to a surgeon who has been doing it for many years, who does lots of them each year. And those surgeons generally tend to get better results than people who do uh, joint replacement just on occasion or the generalist. Not that I'm beating up the general orthopedic surgeon, but joint replacement surgeons who do joint replacement tend to do a better job because they're doing it every day and they're thinking about the issues and problems which occur in joint replacement every day and they're seeing more issues every day so they're prepared to skirt those issues and to potentially avoid any of those issues or complications. So I would say those are some of the multiple factors that lead to some of the differences between some patients who recover very quickly and others who recover more slowly. So I'll move on and then we can have a bunch of questions at the end. Um, of course, patient weight is a factor and the, it's become a hot topic lately because sometimes patients say, oh, well, he'll never operating on me because he's gonna just tell me I'm, I'm too heavy. And that's not necessarily the case. There's been scientific data to show that when patients have a BMI over 40, they have a dramatically increased risk for bleeding, blood clot, and cardiovascular problems after a joint replacement. And so once the insurance company started to find out about this data, they started to mandate that orthopedic practices would start to have patients modify some of their risk factors because we know patient weight is a risk factor. And so we try and get our patients down as close to a BMI as of 40 as possible to minimize their risk for complications. And some patients say, I don't care, I'll sign anywhere. Just show me where to sign. I don't care, I'll, I'm willing to accept the risk. 
Well, the problem is the insurance companies aren't willing to accept that risk because they're paying for it. God forbid a patient has a complication and has to be readmitted to the hospital for, let's say, a blood clot or, or an infection. The insurance companies are the ones that are paying for that. And so that's why the insurance companies are now starting to dictate to the practices, hey, we want you to modify your patient's risk factors, which are modifiable, such as patient weight or diabetes or blood sugar. We want those patients to get under better control because we know a patient who has a joint replacement, for example, whose sugar is wacky and way out of control has a much higher risk for infection than a patient who has their blood sugars under control. And so that's one of the things we do is we're fairly strict in making sure that patient's weight is under somewhat control and that their blood sugars are under somewhat control so that they don't suffer complications and get through the operation more smoothly. Physical therapy is also important, more so for knees than hips. Um, for patients who have a hip replacement, for the most part, all they have to do is walk. But if they need physical therapy, certainly I'll give them a script for physical therapy. And knee replacement patients, I think, benefit from getting physical therapy to get their range of motion back because a knee joint will stiffen up if you don't move it after surgery, whereas a hip will stay limber no matter what. If you lay in bed for six weeks after a hip replacement, this joint will still stay limber, but it, with a knee, it won't, it'll stiffen up. And so physical therapy especially is important after knee replacement. But with good physical therapists and good physical therapy, we can have greater than a 99% success rate. In fact, hip replacement is by actuarial data, the number one, the number one procedure we have in all medical science, followed closely by knee replacement for giving patients what it was billed to give them, a pain-free functional lifestyle, better than cardiac surgery, better than heart transplant, better than GI surgery, joint replacement surgery of the hip and knee are the single two greatest intervention that mankind has in medical science, believe it or not. And that's one of the reasons, one of the prime reasons why I chose going into that field because it has such great success. And so you can see, here's an example. This gentleman um, had a hip replacement done about a year prior by me, the guy flying through the air. And some people have thought the guy getting his chest kicked was me, thankfully not. But this guy was flying like six feet through the air at one year after having his hip replaced by me. And since he's had his opposite hip uh, replaced as well, and he's still going strong as a martial arts instructor. So I have martial arts instructors, I have marathon runners that are, uh, have my hips and knees. Here you see I'm a power lifter. This guy is a, a police sergeant who uh, is a competitive power lifter. That was uh, 475 pounds he lifted uh, a year after having his uh, hip replaced. Um, so it's pretty dramatic. You can see this guy is a spin instructor who sent me this note with a picture attached for how happy he was after having uh, both of his hips replaced at the same time. Uh, here is a patient who had both their knees done. and She showed me the before and after in stockings. You can see how bow-legged she was on the left side and how straight her knees uh, were after having her knees replaced. And she became so excited that she... Uh, she applied uh, for a, a position in my practice and became my surgical scheduler for about seven years uh, in the middle of my There are problems, of course, and uh, patients who, let's say, have a hip replacement uh, can have problems such as infection, dislocation, um, and, and then they can have infections of the knees. And I take care of a, a large number of patients, uh, some by, done by other surgeons, some done by myself, that have to be revised or they, the joint wore out after 15, 20 or 25 years or 30 years, and it just needs to be re-replaced. And so I take on a lot of those complex cases myself as well. And so for patients that have had a joint that's now worn out or gone bad or was never good from the get-go, I take on a lot of those patients. And so I've seen a lot of the problems and because I've seen a lot of those problems, I know how to avoid them the first time so that I can get a patient a good replacement right from the get-go.
And so I've been labeled the Mikey of my practice because I'll take on anything. Um, Let's get Mikey. Yeah. He won't need it. He hates everything. He likes it. Hey, Mikey. So I'm sure many of you remember that uh, commercial from decades ago. And so that's what they refer to me in my practice as the Mikey, because I take on a lot of those difficult patients that other people won't take on um, because it may be too complex or the patient may have too many comorbidities or too many problems. And so I'll take on a lot of those difficult cases. And most of those patients are extremely happy and turn out great with their hip and knee replacement. And so hopefully this has been instructive to you and I thank you for your attention and I'd be more than happy to take on some questions. Right, there are quite a few, so I'll, I'll read them over to you, Dr. Nazarian. Um, so one question, um, can you talk about other non-surgical alternative knee treatment options such as orthobiologic treatments? Do they really work? Sure, um, there are orthobiologic treatments such as PRP, which is uh, an acronym that stands for platelet-rich plasma. So our blood is composed of multiple elements. There's serum, which is basically like the liquid of the blood. There are red blood cells, which are the parts of the blood that carry oxygen to our tissue. There are white blood cells, which are the defense uh, portion of, the, of your blood. Um, and everyone knows that white blood cells provide defense uh, activity. And then there are platelets, which help clot your blood. Uh, platelets, what happen is they, if you have a bleeding area, the platelets go and uh, congregate to a certain area and, and form a scaffolding at, for uh, the clotting cascade, which is another arm of our blood's ability to form a clot form. So there's, there's a mechanical, form of the clot and there's a chemical form to forming a blood clot. And the platelets provide the mechanical form of that clot or the scaffold, if you will, of a tall building or the skeleton of that building, the steel structure of the building are like the platelets in our blood. And so what we do is we take, up, take the blood, spin it in a centrifuge and take out the platelets. So it's platelet rich plasma. So it's it's liquid, which is very rich in platelets. And then they spin that down and then inject the platelets, thinking that the platelets carry some chemical factors with them that will heal that area and diminish inflammation inside the joint. It's had very limited success. None of the insurance companies pay for it because it hasn't been shown to be super clinically successful. Um, and so it, it uh, requires an out-of-pocket cost. So most people like myself don't do it. I mean, it, it, it has minimal effectiveness. Um, stem cell treatment is another one. Stem cells have not been shown to be very effective. Again, extremely expensive. Insurance companies don't pay for it because it hasn't been shown to be uh, effective to enough patients that it's worth the expense. Um, and so most of those alternative treatments are what I said, they're alternative and they don't, they're, they aren't as effective as the mainstream tr stream treatments such as anti-inflammatory medicines by mouth, anti-inflammatory injections, visco supplementations. Uh, one could try PRP or stem cell treatments, but their utility is minimal. And uh, most of the patients I've seen and polled in my practice that have tried PRP probably don't get much more improvement than placebo itself. And there probably is a placebo effect at any way from PRP and stem cell. And so probably most of the effect they're getting is from placebo rather than actually scientific improvement or bio chemical improvement within their joint milieu. And this person asked if people come from far to get a total knee replacement from you. Um, they live in Austin, Texas most of the year, but 
to a couple of months of the year they live in Wilmington, is it safe to have a total knee replacement far from your primary residence? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in fact, I just, it's funny because I, about four weeks ago, I just operated some, uh, on someone from Houston, Texas. So absolutely, I operate on people that live far away. In fact, I just interviewed a woman today who spends most of her time living in Alaska. Um, and she spends a little time here visiting family because she's originally from this area, but now she lives full time in Alaska. And I'm, I'm going to be operating on her um, in a couple of months. Um, so yes, the answer to that question is an absolute yes. We would ask that you stay around for maybe a couple of weeks or a week or two uh, after the replacement so we can make sure that your incision is nicely on its way towards healing. And then you can safely go back either by plane or by car um, back to a place like Texas or somewhere else far away. Um, and then the remainder of our visits could be done through telehealth. Uh, most of the world, thanks to COVID, is now wedded to the idea of telehealth visits and uh, visits through the computer. And so we can easily do that. We can review your x-rays. We can do uh, a pretty good physical exam now through telehealth. And in fact, I've signed up patients for surgery who live far away and I do a telehealth visit on the computer and uh, look at their x-rays on the computer and then sign them up for surgery and then visit them in person for the first day, the day of the surgery or the day before surgery. And then, uh, and then I follow them in the office uh, afterwards to make sure, as I said, they're healing and everything looks good. We can do an x-ray before they go back to their, to their um, normal living location. And, uh, and then for future visits, we can do via telehealth as needed. So absolutely that occurs. It, it currently uh, occurs in my practice on a routine basis. And so I'd be absolutely um, enthusiastic to take care of somebody from you know, far away because it, I continue to do it and uh, do it successfully. Okay, a couple of questions on physical therapy. Um, did you require pre-physical therapy before knee replacements? No, uh, pre-physical therapy hasn't really been shown to be that helpful. Um, and it's relatively expensive. And sometimes you'll, a patient will use up some of their therapy visits prior to surgery that we would rather them use after surgery. And so for, if a patient's having a knee replacement, what I tell them to do is get an ankle weight and extend their knee, you know, their foot forward as if they're sitting on a chair and do knee extension exercises. Um, to strengthen their quads as much as possible. If they're having a hip replacement, I, have, I tell them to lie on their side and lift the side where they're going to have the hip replacement, lift that foot up in the air like the old Jane Fonda uh, exercise. Um, and so that strengthens the muscles on the side of the hip. And so those are really the only prehab exercises I would tell a patient to perform, which would get them optimized from a physical therapy standpoint before the surgery. Um, but going to formal physical therapy, I don't think is really that helpful. It may be expensive and you may use up some of your allowed visits from your insurer. And so I would say it's not that important and certainly I, I don't uh, enforce it. And if somebody really wants it, I'll give them a prescription so they can do it. I, I don't withhold physical therapy on patients who really want it, I believe to give a patient what they want, you know, because, I, if I, you know, I'm a, I, I feel like what we do is in the customer service business. And so I try and take care of patients and their individual needs. So I tailor my treatment to the needs of each individual patient. So if a patient wants prehab or pre-physical therapy before surgery, I'll write them a prescription. Do I require it though? No, I don't require it. Okay. Um, this person's a 58-year-old woman who was a marathon runner. After being diagnosed with hip osteoarthritis, she was told she should never run again. Is this the end of the road or is there something that can be done? Not in my practice. It's not the end of the road. I have, I have literally dozens of marathon runners or half marathon runners in my practice. So I perform a hip replacement through a minimally invasive approach. 
which doesn't afford it or affords no muscle cutting so they can recover quickly. But also since their muscles haven't been compromised, they'll not only get back to their active lifestyle more quickly, but their muscles haven't ever been compromised. So they'll be able to build back their muscles for such things as long distance running more effectively because their muscles will have never been compromised from the surgical experience. And I absolutely allow those patients to get back to running both hip replacement patients and knee replacement patients. I let them run again. If they were a runner before surgery, I let them run after surgery. And as I said, I have martial arts instructors. I have yoga instructors. I have marathon runners who have my joint replacements and I allow them to get back to their active lifestyle. And I think it's important to let a patient do what they want to do because I think if, they, if they're a runner before, it has a lot to do with their mental health and well-being. And so I want a patient to get back to be able to do some of the things they want to do. In fact, I have some patients who are triathletes who do triathlons um, after having their joints replaced. Okay. Um, two questions. I'll combine these. Um, does the brand of the knee matter? Um, what is quad sparing knee? Do you do quad sparing knee replacement and do you use robotics? Uh, the answer is yes to, all, to both those questions. I do use robotics. Um, do I think robotics is an advancement? Uh, it's a little bit of an advancement and I'll tell you why I think it's an, I'll answer the last question first. Um, I do uh, I use robotics. I think it's a bit of advancement. I, I've done knee replacements now for almost 25 years, and I've done about 500 knee replacements a year. So I've done almost 12,000 or more knee replacements in my career. And so I feel very experienced and very confident and very comfortable that personally, without sounding boastful or, um, or arrogant, I hope I don't sound that way, that I feel like I do a knee replacement better than what a what a what a computer can do or what a robot can do. But what the robot does is it helps the surgeon balance the ligaments because a knee replacement, unfortunately, in many surgeons' hands has been thought of as a bony operation because we use cutting jigs or cutting tools that are, that are sort of borrowed from the world of carpentry to shave the ends of the bone away. And so surgeons have, have sort of morphed into thinking that this is a bony operation, whereas it really is a combination of a bony operation and a soft tissue operation. And I feel like one of the failures of us as an industry is that we have focused more on the bones, on the hard tissues than we have on the soft tissues. And what the, and, and so, we have not allowed the ligaments and one of the failure mechanisms of knee replacements are knees that are performed when the ligaments are not appropriately tight or appropriately balanced. Meaning what I mean by balance is the ligaments on the inside are equally tight with the ligaments on the outside of the knee or outer portion of the knee. And so surgeons don't pay attention to that as closely as they should. And they, part of it is they haven't been taught to do that. And what the, uh, what the robot does is it helps the surgeon pay closer attention to the soft tissues because once you put the, the, uh, the tools where the robot can recognize a patient's knee is you do an examination of the knee prior to making any of the bony cuts so that the robot can register the soft tissues um, and the ligament tightness and balance in the knee before doing the, the, the bony uh, alignment and bony shaving. And then, after, and then it programs the, the bone shaves and bone cuts to be performed based on that ligamentous tensioning and ligamentous balance. And so that's what I, one of the things I think is the advancement is for surgeons who have gotten away or haven't really been taught appropriate ligamentous balancing the robot is an improvement and an advancement for those. Uh, you know, I've always done ligamentous balancing along with my appropriate bony cuts. And so that's why in my hands, I don't know that the robot 
is that much of an advancement, even though I use it. Um, I think it will get better and better, just as all technologies get better and better and robots will get better. But the robot is not like we don't just you don't attach a robot to the knee and then the, a robot takes over and does the knee replacement. It's a robotic arm and the surgeon is actually powering that robotic arm. So the surgeon is involved throughout the entire procedure with a robot, but the robotic arm makes the, 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 the cut or shave of the bone in the place that the robot was determined to do it such that the components fit on appropriately and that the ligaments are also appropriately balanced. So I don't know if that was a short, a very, very long answer to a short question. Yes, the answer is I do use robots. I don't push it on my patients because in my hands, I don't know that it's that much of an advancement. But for people that want to have their knee done through a robot, I do it with the robot. Um, but I think ultimately it comes down to the surgeon and the surgeon's experience to make sure that that knee comes out great. And so if a below average surgeon uses a robot, yeah, it may make them a little bit better or a below experienced surgeon uses a robot, it may make that knee come out a little bit better. But for surgeons that have a tremendous amount of experience, I think the surgeon is more watching the robot than the robot watching the surgeon, if you know what I mean. Um, um, and then as far as quad sparing knee, yes, I do a quad sparing knee. And quad sparing means, knee means we're not cutting into the quadriceps. And that just has been shown to allow a patient to recover faster. So it's a less invasive technique that we don't cut into the quadriceps so that the patient, you know, you don't cut into the muscle and, and, and just like with hip replacements, you don't cut the muscle and the patients recover faster. Same thing with the knee, less muscle cutting, quicker recovery. And so, yes, I perform quad sparing knees. And then the other question was about the knee implant. And most of the popular implant companies now produce knee replacements, which are all quite good. Um, and so I generally use implants mostly from uh, Zimmer and from uh, Stryker, but I occasionally will use a knee from Smith and Nephew. And there aren't really, it's splitting hairs to determine the difference between each, in, each implant. And I use different implants for different, um, uh, different issues that may come up on a patient's knee that I look at on their preoperative x-ray. And I might determine that the striker knee is better uh, shaped for this particular patient's knee and the Zimmer knee is better shaped for one particular patient's knee. But all in all, there's not really that much difference between uh, knee implants. And it really comes down to uh, the surgeon who's putting in that implant to this, which adds to the success of the knee. You know, you could put the best set of golf clubs in my hands and I'll never hit the ball as straight or as long or as accurately as Tiger Woods, um, even if you gave him the worst set of golf clubs around. It's, so it's really more about the user and the implanter than it is about the device, because most of the implant companies make very good devices these days that, have, that stand the test of time. Okay, there are, there are quite a few questions. I know we're running a little- Yeah, no, I'll, I'll take as much time as you need. I'm not in a rush. Okay. And so I'm happy to answer questions. Okay. How many cortisone shots can you get before you decide on surgery? Great question. Um, generally speaking, if cortisone injections last you three months or more, three months, six months, nine months, or a year or more, then I'd say, you know, you can keep getting them. And some people think, oh, I can only get three injections. That's a, that's a myth. You can get multiple injections. I wouldn't give more than three or four in a year's time. Um, I wouldn't give them weekly. I would give them every three or four months over a year. So three to four injections total for a year. But there have been patients that I've injected for years. I mean, for decades, I've injected. I had, a, I had the oldest instructor at the Curtis Institute of Music who I injected her all up, up until her 105th birthday. And she died just before her 
106th birthday and she wasn't interested in getting a knee replacement. She didn't really need a knee replacement. She wasn't fully bone on bone. Um, and I injected her knees. I could almost set my calendar on her every three months for coming in and getting an injection. And I had a good relationship and good rapport uh, with this patient, so much so that when she was you know, finally in her 105th year, she was still actively teaching and working as a piano instructor at the Curtis Institute, which is a famous music school here in Philadelphia. And students would go to her apartment. And finally, she said, you know what? I'm sick of coming into the office. And I figured at 105, she deserved me to give her uh, uh, house calls. And so I was walking out of my office carrying needles and syringes one day, looking like a drug addict. And my office manager said, you know, you ought to, if you're going to continue to make house calls, you ought to get a doctor's bag. And I went over to this woman's apartment that night. And ironically, she had waiting as a present for me, this beautiful leather doctor's bag. And so, you know, it was a, a nice gift. And so he's, she's a perfect example of somebody who I've injected for a long period of time. And, uh, so I would say if injections are, easy answer is if injections are working, continue to do them until they don't really work anymore. And then if you're noticing that the knee or the hip, the hip I wouldn't have injected more than two or three times. And I wouldn't probably recommend a hip to be injected ever, more than every six months because the risk of infection after a hip injection is slightly higher than after a knee injection, whereas the knee is right under the skin. So you can easily do that injection in the office. Whereas generally I recommend the hip to be injected under a special either x-ray machine or ultrasound machine. And I don't do hip injections myself, uh, meaning hip joint injections. I'll inject a bursa around the hip, but I won't inject the joint. I'll send them to a radiologist who does it under a either an x-ray machine or an ultrasound machine so they can accurately inject the hip joint. But I generally don't recommend more than two or three hip injections, and I don't recommend them more frequently than every six months. And knees, I will inject as much as three to four months uh, frequency. And I would say with knee injections, they could get them until they don't really work as effectively. And if they only last a week or two weeks or even three to four weeks, then I'd say maybe that's the time where you start thinking about going for a joint replacement. Okay. Can sporadic pain in my legs be caused by my hip or should I look at a spinal issue? It depends where the sporadic pain is. If the pain is in your groin, it could be the hip and it could be the spine, probably more likely the hip. If it's in your buttock, it's probably more likely your spine. If it radiates down below your knee, it's probably more likely your spine. If it radiates from the groin to the knee, probably more likely the hip. So if you're having also at the same time trouble putting on your shoes and socks, probably it's the hip. If you get numbness and tingling or burning sensation, probably the spine. Okay. Is there a trend to address pain six months six months after a knee revision where you can feel the implant rubbing against the inside of your leg while walking. I assume that's a knee. Um, yes. Um, knee revision. Yeah, because the knee is you know, basically right on, you know, under the skin. There's not very much soft tissue between the knee joint or a knee replacement and the outside world, whereas the hip is buried by pretty deep muscles and thick muscles. So you don't ever really feel that. If you feel something up, or up around the hip, it's the bone of the upper end of the femur. Whereas the knee, generally you don't feel the knee implant itself. Generally you'll feel the bones around the knee, um, but it depends. I mean, sometimes you might feel the bones or a, even a bone spur that hasn't been removed around that joint replacement. Oftentimes a patient points to their kneecap and say, yeah, this is my implant. I can feel it rubbing where I didn't feel it before. Well, maybe that implant has made the joint a little bit thicker or bulkier, but you're really feeling the bone rather than the implant. So it, it, would, it would require me to probably examine you um, or examine a particular patient to determine if they're actually feeling the joint rubbing or is it really a bone that's rubbing? Or sometimes 
the alignment of the joint has been changed in such a way that the joint, the whole entire joint, meaning the, the knee is rubbing against the opposite knee and it becomes uncomfortable. For example, women don't like their knees that are very knock knee. And so we try to make a woman's knee when we do a knee replacement, a little less knock knee than in a man's because especially if they have a larger thigh, you don't want the th inner part of the thighs rubbing together. And so you can help avoid that by making the alignment of that implant slightly less knock need than, than, uh, than in another patient who would tolerate being a little bit more knock need. And the alignment for a knee, knock knee, a little bit of knock need is normal because of the biomechanics of our lower extremity, the hip, the knee, and the ankle. If we drop the line, of plumb line, like a weight off of a, a string off the hip joint, you'd want the center of the hip joint to line up with the center of the knee joint. You'd want it to be right above the center of the knee and centered over the ankle joint. Just like when you're building a door, you want the threshold to be directly under the header of the door. You don't want it to be off center and you don't want the door to be like tilted to the side. Just the, so the same way with our joints, you want the hip to be right over the knee and right over the ankle. And to create that biomechanical axis, we have to correctly align the knee. And so those are some of the challenges that we have in performing a knee replacement is to put in a joint that's appropriately aligned and also appropriately balanced so that mechanically it works correctly and the patient has confidence when they put weight on their knee and they can use it like the natural knee that they were born with. Will a valgus knee that needs to be replaced cause hip pain and eventually cause hip problems? It can. A valgus knee, a valgus knee is a knock knee knee. So we call valgus knock knock knee is called valgus, and that's the medical term, valgus, V-A-L-G-U-S. And varus, V-A-R-U-S, is a bow-legged knee. Um so a knock kneed knee or a valgus knee can cause hip pain in the sense that when it becomes really knock kneed, it can shorten the extremity and a shorter extremity will cause you to waddle more and walk from side to side, which puts more stresses on the hip joint. So that in and of itself can cause more hip pain. Um, so yes, the, the easy answer is yes, it can cause more hip pain and can cause more biomechanical problems with the hip joint, because when the knee becomes more and more knock need, it becomes, I mean, yes, more and more knock need, it becomes shorter. Same thing when it becomes more bow-legged as well. That can shorten the extremity and can also lead to issues with the hip. Okay. Um, let's see. How long does a gel shot, like an orthovisc shot last? Generally speaking, uh, it be, could be considered successful if it lasts six months or more. The insurance companies will not uh, authorize use of that product because it's reasonably expensive. They'll not authorize use of it more often than every six months. So if it works a lot less than six months, then it's not really that much of a success because you can only get it every six months. If it lasts three months, not bad, but not great either. But uh, they should last a little bit longer because they are more expensive. Um, are they better? Not necessarily so. They both have advantages and disadvantages. Cortisone and injections like that, any type of steroid, provides anti-inflammatory effect, but no lubrication. The visco supplements, such as orthovisc or synvisc or monovisc, or Uflexa or Suparts, those provide lubrication to the joint, but no anti-inflammatory effect. So I generally recommend doing and performing a cortisone injection because it's less expensive. The insurance companies don't balk at it. You don't need pre-authorization. And quite honestly, I think it works more predictably than the visco supplementary injections. But if those don't work, then I'll try 
a viscous injection if it's appropriate for a patient. And if that works, then I'll have them get it every six months if it works for a while. And if it stops working, just like the steroid type injections, then I'll recommend the next step be a joint replacement. Okay. Is it better to wait and get in shape prior to knee replacement or to get a knee replacement and then get in shape? Well, it's a two-edged sword, obviously. Some, I mean, if you're way out of shape, it's definitely better to get in shape prior or somewhat in better shape prior to the replacement because you'll be able to recover more quickly and rehab more effectively. If you're in moderate shape, you know, I wouldn't necessarily belabor getting the replacement and then you can work on getting in shape after because there's somewhat of a problem that we, our body is built with a self-protective mechanism. Our joints actually are built with governors. Like, you know, there is a governor on an engine to make sure it doesn't rev too high and burn itself out. Our joints are actually built with governors. And those governors are such that there's a, a direct feedback from a joint back to the muscle that supplies muscle power around that joint. For example, the knee has a governor that supplies uh, a nerve to the quadriceps. So when you have knee arthritis, sometimes the knee will give way. And the reason why the knee gives way is because the governor that's built inside that knee actually shuts down the quadriceps muscles and the knee can give way because of that governor that's built inside the joint. And it's one of the reasons why it's harder to build up muscles around an arthritic joint, because that governor is designed to protect the joint and to slow down and, and have the muscles work less and actually atrophy. So it's very common for muscles around a joint that's arthritic to atrophy. So if you look at your arthritic knee and it may, uh, the quads may be more atrophied around an arthritic knee or above an arthritic knee than the non-arthritic joint, your opposite knee. And the reason is because that governor has been designed to shut down the muscles slightly to protect the joint and make it last longer. And this was created by the grand designer in the sky um, to self-preserve our joints before the days of joint replacement. Now that we have joint replacements, that negative feedback loop to the muscles is then shut off after the joint is replaced and you can build back your muscles. So if you're way out of shape, I would recommend getting in a little bit better shape. But if you're in moderate shape, trying to get your muscles built up and strengthen your quads may be a fruitless experience because of that negative feedback loop that's designed in our arthritic joints to have them preserve themselves for longer periods of time. And so once you get the joint replaced, then you can effectively and efficiently build back those quad muscles again because the negative feedback loop has been removed with the joint replacement. Okay, could you please address if you should have knee cortisone shots or the orthodox gel shots inserted via fluoroscopy? Say that question again. Could you please address if you should have knee cortisone shots or orthodox shots inserted via fluoroscopy? Okay, sure. Um, cortisone shots are given in both the knee and the hip. Um, and you can do knee injections very easily because the knee, you can feel your own knee. It's right under the skin practically and you know thin soft tissues under uh, the skin. And so a knee injection can be easily performed without fluoroscopy or without ultrasound. Whereas a hip injection, I mean, some people do try and perform hip injections in the office without fluoroscopy or without ultrasound. I don't do it because I don't think it's very accurate. And I don't think even people who think they're being very accurate are that accurate. And so I generally recommend it being done, hip injections being done under fluoroscopy or ultrasound, either one. A fluoroscopy, a fluoroscope is a moving x-ray. So you can actually see 
in real time where the needle is going into the joint. Ultrasound, same thing. It's an ultrasound machine and it works differently, but you can see where the needle is going in relation to the joint. So you can direct it accurately into the joint because the hip is buried by deep muscles, as I said earlier. And so I generally recommend hip injections being done under some sort of x-ray uh, uh, augmentation or advice. And knee injections can be done easily in the office without ultrasound. I mean, there are some people who do it with ultrasound, but it's not really needed in my opinion for a knee injection. That can be either uh, cortisone or steroid injections in the knee or visco supplementation like this, like synvisc or monovisc or orthovisc for the knee. To clarify, orthovisc or monovisc or synvisc is not FDA approved for the hip. That doesn't mean that people can't do it. It's just not FDA approved. Um, you're not going to be arrested if you have it done, but the insurance company is not going to pay for it. So for the few patients who say, oh, I want an orthovisc injection and I wanted it for my arthritic hip, the patient would have to pay for that medication out of pocket, which can be anywhere from $600 to $1,000 for the, for the supplement, for the viscous supplement. They would buy it and then give it to a radiologist and then the radiologist would inject it into the joint. But insurance won't pay for the... Um, for the medication because it's not FDA approved because the scientific studies haven't really shown it. Uh, they haven't done enough scientific studies to show it be effective in the, in the joint. That doesn't necessarily mean it wouldn't work, but um, sometimes we don't have scientific studies that prove that something is good or not good to the degree that an insurance company feels that it's appropriate and they would pay for it, just like the PRP. That hasn't been shown scientifically on enough patients to be uh, helpful enough. And so that's why the insurance companies choose not to pay for it. Same thing with orthovisc or monovisc or synvisc in the hip. They don't pay for it in the hip. It can be done. And I've, uh, had, I've given it to patients or given a patient prescription for it for a few patients who wanted it, but it's not paid for so that hopefully that clarifies. You can get, get it paid for by insurance for both cortisone and monovisc or synvisc in the knee. You can get cortisone in the hip, but not monovisc or synvisc in the hip paid for by insurance, but you could pay for it out of pocket and have it done in the hip joint. Okay. What would you give for pain control to someone after a knee replacement who, who can't really stomach uh, pain meds? Generally, I use a host of different medications. Years ago, we used to just zonk patients with narcotics, oxycodone or Percocet or Oxycontin. And part, in large part because of the opioid uh, crisis, we've learned how to manage patients' pain after surgery without giving them so many narcotics. And so a lot of time, a lot of patients can't tolerate narcotics because they have side effects themselves, nausea, vomiting, uh, dizziness, uh, stomach upset, constipation. Um, and so what we've learned is that we can give patients a host of medicines. And just like in making a soup, when you make a soup, you add a little bit of oregano, a little bit of thyme, a little bit of garlic, and a little bit of salt and it all comes out spiced nicely, we can kind of do the same thing in treating patients with pain medication after. We use a little bit of narcotic and none if they can't tolerate it at all, a little bit of Tylenol, a little bit of a muscle relaxant, a little bit of a nerve medicine such as gabapentin or Neurontin um, and a, an anti-inflammatory and maybe and, um, and, uh, and muscle relaxants like Tizanidine. Um, and so just like in making a soup, you use a little bit of each and they potentiate each other to make the soup taste better. If you use a little bit of all those classes of drugs after surgery, you can make a patient get through the operation, feel more like themselves quickly, not zonk them out with narcotics and get them through the operation and the post-operative period 
much more effectively and get them back to their active lifestyle effectively, especially in the patient who can't tolerate high doses of pain medicine. Okay, a couple of more and then we'll let everyone get back to their night. Um, thanks so much, Dr. Nazarian. Um, does Voltaren cream help knee arthritis? Uh, yes, Voltaren cream, Voltaren is an anti-inflammatory. Um, it uh, has anti-inflammatory effects and it's a topical, so it doesn't have really the systemic effects that, that oral Voltaren or oral anti-inflammatory such as Advil, Motrin, or Aleve, or Ibuprofen have. So you can rub it on, it gets directly to the site of action. It will not cure knee arthritis. It will not put back cartilage in your knee, but it will take away some of the inflammation in the joint. In fact, some patients have inflammation in the joint after they've had a knee replacement. And sometimes they may get inflammation just because the soft tissues are rubbing around there's still soft tissues are rubbing against the joint, just like a joint replacement, just like they are the arthritic joint. And sometimes patients can get inflammation. They don't get arthritis of a replaced joint, but they get inflammation around a joint. And sometimes using something such as Voltaren gel to take away the inflammation in the subcutaneous or tissues just below the skin under that or around that joint can be helped by using a topical agent. So yes, it can help some of the symptoms of knee arthritis, but it's not going to cure knee arthritis. Okay. How soon after a hip replacement can you use stairs? Uh, usually within a day um, or the same day. Um, one of the criteria we use before, or I use and, and we use at the hospital before sending a patient home is that they're able to go up and down stairs because most patients have a bedroom or a bathroom on a second floor. The majority of patients don't necessarily live on one floor and have to negotiate stairs at their home. So the criteria for discharging a patient from the facility is that they're able to go up and down stairs on their own. And so patients can go up and down stairs usually the same day of the surgery or the next day after surgery. Okay. How about knees and steps after surgery? Same thing, either okay. the same day or the next day. Okay. All right. I think you usually can, can get yeah. upstairs, you know, one step at a time. They may not do a reciprocal gait for a while, meaning one step and then another step. They used to do one step at a time, but it's easy to do to get up one step at a time very quickly after surgery. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, they can perform that. So yeah, I thank you everyone for their attention. Hopefully Natalie can provide you information if anyone wants to make an appointment to see me um, now or in the near future, I'd be happy to discuss some of these issues more at length that we touched on tonight. And I'd be more than happy to explain them in person. Um, as you can see, I, you know, I'm happy to explain. Hopefully you found me to be a relatively good teacher. And I think that's what uh, part of a doc, I mean, the word doctor actually means teacher, believe it or not. And so I feel like it behooves us as surgeons and as physicians in general to be good teachers to our patients so they can teach them, teach them to be good uh, shepherds of their own body. And so even though I'm a surgeon and they pay me to do surgery, I don't necessarily recommend everyone for surgery. I only recommend it when it's appropriate. And I, uh, and I usually try and talk patients out of surgery if I don't think it's appropriate. So I feel like I, I do the right thing by each individual patient because I'm a human just like you are. And I wouldn't necessarily want to have to have surgery if I don't have to have it. But if it's appropriate and I feel like it's going to make an improvement in your life, then and then and there, I'll recommend it. So uh, I'd be happy to see any of you who stayed on as a patient and take you on as a patient and uh, hopefully help improve your life. Thanks Dr. Nazarian. And I did, yes, absolutely. If you would like to schedule an appointment, if you have any questions, I did put, you all have my email already. Um, I did put it in the chat box. Please feel free to reach out to me. Um, we will be sending this recording out as well so you can review it. 
Um, yeah, so thank you so much for joining. Have a great night and thanks again, Dr. Nazarian. Great job. You're most welcome. Thank you, Natalie, for setting this up. Absolutely. Have a nice night, everyone. All right, you too. Take care. Bye-bye.